Yeah. yeah, yeah. Back. Back with a snack. Video. With another freaking video, man. You already know what it is, man. Got a little bit more time and so. Oh, man, before I go, man, like, comment, subscribe. Come on, show you, show us some love. Don't take your nose dive. Hey, so I want I look at it as time so dismantling dismantling America. I've been tongue twisting for the last three videos. Dismantling America. So I want to see how he's dismantling it. Or what is he saying that will that just really brings takes it apart. Mm hmm Those are mine, aren't they? Hmm? Aren't those mine? My headphones. Aren't those mine? You know, stretch them, thank you. What? Your head. <laughs> your, your head look like Ooh, when you came, out, you came out, your mom, you should just squeeze your head. She was what like, I don't like how round that head is. What a mellow head. What a mellow head. What a mellow head. All right, Be sure to follow us on Twitter, if you would, at twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Uh, comment, ask questions, suggest guests. A fellow at the Hoover Institution, Dr. Thomas Sowell has taught economics, intellectual history, and social policy at such institutions as Cornell, Amherst, and UCLA. The author of more than a dozen books, Dr. Sowell has just published a collection of essays, mm. Dismantling America. Wow. Tom, welcome. Oh, good to be here. Segment one, Decline and Fall, from Dismantling America, quote, the collapse of a civilization is not just the replacement of rulers or institutions with new rulers and new institutions, it is the destruction of a whole way of life and the painful and sometimes pathetic attempts of rebuilding am amid the ruins. Is that where America is headed? I believe it is." Close quote. Now, whatever troubles we have, it's still the richest, most powerful nation in the world. We're still, still fundamentally at peace. Some soldiers in Iraq, some soldiers in Afghanistan, some in Germany, some in South Korea, but relatively small wars by historical standards in Afghanistan and Iraq. How can you say such a thing? Well, you know, that description would also have fit the United States on December 6, 1941. So it's like the argument that was used when I, when I used to question what, whether Social Security was fiscally sound. And I said, Social Security has never missed a payment. It's never been a day late or a dollar short. I said, wow. that's always true right up to the moment of collapse. <laughs> Again, from Dismantling America. While the Obama administration is not the root cause of the ominous dangers that face this country at home and abroad, it is the embodiment the personification and the culmination of dangerous trends that began decades ago. Mm. How does the President of the United States embody dangerous trends? How do you see this man? Oh my gosh. Uh, I see him as someone who all his life has been associated with and part of a group of people who fundamentally don't believe in the principles of this country. Mm. Not only people, we're, we're, the most obvious example, obviously, is Jeremiah, right? Uh, people like Bill Ayers, whom he's, you know, tried to disavow. Uh, but people who uh, fundamentally think that we're on the wrong track, we have the wrong principles, and we need to be changed, whether we want to be or not. Tom, you mentioned Jeremiah Wright, his pastor mm. at uh, uh, a church in Chicago. You mentioned Bill Ayers, who was a former member of uh, well, the Weather Underground. The Weather Terrorist Underground, exactly. Group. What about his formation, his intellectual formation at Columbia Harvard Law School? You well, talking, as he, as he, he himself says, uh, he always sought out the most radical people. Mm. Uh, he worked as a community organizer. I don't think most people stop and think, what does a community organizer do? He doesn't organize a community. <laughs> it's not he bake sales. Huh? It's not bake sales he's organizing. No, he's not, he's not telling people in the community how, how, how to uh, shop better and stuff like that. He is mobilizing all the resentments organizing them in order to uh, put them into uh, a battle to get what they want from other people. Now, you talk about Barack Obama as embodying dangerous trends, quote, that began decades ago. Oh, yes. When? This is during your lifetime, during your adult yeah, lifetime? Yeah, yes, and right. perhaps even a little earlier. But I think what you see in, uh, in, the, in the, most clearly, I think, in the academic world are people who don't think that this country is, is, a, is a, a great country, uh, one example of a colleague of mine who teaches at Harvard, uh, after 9-11, put a, uh, an American flag on his car 
And his colleagues said, what is that for? Mm. Uh, when I visited Berkeley in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, when, when there were you know, flags everywhere, I did not see one flag on the Berkeley campus, mm. on any of those expensive houses. You know, when I, was, I was coming back from Berkeley, the first American flag I saw was in a low-income black neighborhood in, in Elkland. Mm. Wow. Uh, these are people who consider themselves citizens of the world. And, that, and that, that, that the rest of us are so lucky to have them here to change America so that people like us don't have uh, a voice. And of course, the whole way that Obama has operated with these enormous bills that no one has ever had chi time to read, uh, uh, that they rush through, when they're putting people in power who don't have to go through the confirmation process so that we don't find out what they're like except by if there's an expose on Fox News or someplace. Uh, I mean, his whole thing has been to circumvent the American public in order to put in things that they clearly don't want, as shown by the polls, as shown by this recent uh, repudiation in, in Missouri. All right, that's, that's a question. Uh, Barack Obama won by about seven percentage points. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest for a Democratic presidential candidate. Bill Clinton won by eight. FDR won by big. But that's the, he, he's mm -hmm. in the top three Democratic finishers in mm -hmm. the last seven decades, mm -hmm. Barack Obama is. So here's the question. You've described him, you've described the academic elites, to what extent, the American people voted for him. Yes. To what extent do you see a corrosion of values among the American people themselves on the one hand? On the other hand, to what extent is there just a kind of creeping takeover by an elite that, is, that fails to share, that is opposed to the values that most Americans share? There's, bo there's both things. And I think part of, part of the reason so many people voted for him was that um, what they got through the media uh, was so uh, filtered mm -hmm. that the, you know they poo-pooed this man having been uh, a member of a church uh, uh, run by a ranting racist uh, because they wanted to believe that he was going to be a unifier. Mm -hmm. Community organizers don't unify. Mm -hmm. They divide. They polarize. That's how they get what they want. Uh, you know, I, I never thought of Acorn as, as, as a unifying uh, force in American life. Uh, and and, and this, this man is not. But, of course, if they don't know that, then, of course, they may vote for him. So it's the press. Mm -hmm. It's Barack Obama and the administration. I mean, this is all brand new to me. You know what I mean? I have no words. I am in shock. Most black people vote for him because he was black. Let's be real. That's it. And that was it. Not to say all the policies and things that were put in place that have set up to why things are like this now, because they are. Who was in place before Barack Obama? Bush. <laughs> Barack Obama? <laughs> what? What? What you, <laughs> you said Barack Obama. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Yeah, I, wow. That's all I'm going to say. Certain keep, stuff. This is interesting. Uh, yeah. It's the elites at academic institutions. But, but it's, it's, not, it's not just a thing that happened now. Long before Barack Obama's name became known, uh, there was this attitude um, essentially repudiating this, the, mm -hmm. uh, the principles of, of the country. I mean, it started, I think, with Woodrow Wilson, who was the first president of the United States to openly say that the Constitution, uh, you know, needed to be superseded. And he didn't mean that there needed to be amendments to the Constitution, which, which you know, anybody can be for, uh, uh, because, but, but that the courts should do this. In other words, to circumvent the public, the voting public, uh, and put in the things that the judges think uh, ought to be put in, irrespective of what the Constitution says. Segment two. Dismantling America. Two quotations. The first comes from your book, Dismantling America. This segment is on marriage. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, you write, said that the life of the law has not been logic but experience. Vast numbers of laws have accumulated and evolved over the centuries based on experience with male, female unions. There is no reason why all those laws should be transferred willy-nilly to a different kind of union, one with neither the inherent tendency to produce children or the inherent asymmetries of relationships between people of different sexes. That's quotation one. Mm -hmm. Here's quotation two. U.S. District Judge Vaughn Walker ruling in Perry versus Schwarzenegger on August 4th. Mm -hmm. Quote, gender, 
no longer forms an essential part of marriage. Close quote. I just dropped that in your lap to see what you do with it, Dr. Sowell. <laughs> well, you know, the most important decision uh, is always who makes the decision. And so the question is not what is the role of gender for this judge to decide. But since we are presumably still, for the moment at least, a self-governing nation, uh, it's, for the, it's for the voting public to decide. And so the fact that he feels that way, that's wonderful. Let him vote that way in the, in the privacy of the voting booth. But let him not say that this is now the law of the land just because he happens to think that way. Mm. Tom, let me give you just another couple of quotations from Judge Vaughn Walker's ruling the other day. Uh, Judge Walker, the traditional understanding of marriage represents, quote, nothing more than an artifact of a foregone notion that men and women fulfill different roles in civic life. Close quote. That's an artifact. Well, uh, one might say that Judge Walker is an artifact of what, what goes on in academia and particularly in the law school. But again, the question is, whose decision is that? Mm. Is that a judge is there to decide that the rest of us, that what we believe is, uh, is just not worth thinking about? Mm -hmm. Or is he there to uh, carry out the laws that have been passed the by the duly elected uh, representatives? That makes me think about the whole thing, like what is a woman? Mm -hmm. That's what it makes me think about, like it's anything, you can pick whatever you want now, you do what you want now. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. That's what it makes me, that's what it's. Mm -hmm. You know that during this trial, he had a long fact-finding phase in which one sociologist and expert after another came in to testify about the roles of genders, the state of marriage in the 21st century, and so forth. You just brush all that aside? No, none of that uh, is a substitute for, the, for, for we the people, which is what the Constitution is about. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I could give you an impressive list of people who have said absurd things. In fact, if you were to uh, make a list of all the absurd things said by brilliant people, it would be longer than the Encyclopedia Britannica. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one more from Judge Walker here. Quote, the evidence shows conclusively that moral and religious views form the only basis for the belief that same-sex couples are different from opposite-sex couples." Close quote. Well, it may be conclusive to him, but again, the question is, whose decision is it? Is it? Obviously, it's not conclusive to other people, or else the, the proposition that he was ruling on would never have passed. And been passed with the votes of seven million Californians, yes. by the way. All right, so let me ask you, just step back from that a little bit wow. and ask you this question. How did we go in the space of a couple of decades, maybe three, but I think probably closer to two, from an America in which the notion of same-sex marriage was literally unthinkable. That is to mm -hmm. say, it was in nobody's head. Mm -hmm. So outlandish mm -hmm. that it never occurred to anyone. Mm -hmm. To Barack Obama. a sitting judge, federal judge, a, named to the federal bench, by the way, by George H.W. Bush. Heaven help us. Uh, coming out with an opinion like this. What happened to the legal regime, to the social mor uh, to the mores? What, what, to, well, this is, why, this, is, this, is, this is why I say that Obama is really the culmination of a trend. He didn't do this by himself. Mm. Nope. That there was a, a notion out there, a set of notions really, about the country, about what, what was right, and about who should make what decisions. Those notions were out there, you know, b b before he ever became a public figure. Wow. Uh, but now that he, and I think what you saw was an erosion of the confidence in the country and the country's culture, its principles and so erosion. forth. And all of this happened. And what is happening now is what was just a, an erosion, sort of almost uh, uncoordinated and so on, uh, to, to, a, to a deliberate attempt on his part to change the country in fundamental ways. Now, you talked about Woodrow Wilson wow. yep. with a certain kind of rot setting in with Woodrow Wilson oh, yes. and the progressives, the sort of elitism. I, Woodrow Wilson, know far better than that, oh, that, yeah. that non-entity James Madison who drafted the yeah. Constitution. Right. All right. But in more recent times, times that you and I can remember, we had Ronald Reagan mm -hmm. and the sense that somehow the country was coming back. Mm -hmm. How do we go from Ronald Reagan to Barack Obama? How do you go from a, a reassertion mm. of what seems to be fundamental faith in the country to a Judge Vaughn Walker? What happened mm. in the space of just two or three decades? Well, I think it started immediately with Reagan's successor, George H.W. Bush, a no doubt a decent man, an honorable man. But uh, 
one who disdained what he called this vision thing. In other words, that uh, an over overarching sense of principles that you'd be fighting for. Uh, to me, I think one of the moments that sort of gave, gave a clue was when, uh, during one of the presidential uh, debates, when uh, Bush is looking at his watch. Right. I can't imagine <laughs> Ronald Reagan or any Democrat, for that matter, looking at his watch during a. I mean, where's you know, you got to go? Bush was, and and I think the the, mo, the, mo, the first moment that you saw a glimpse of this was when Bush first took off at Bush 41, and started talking about a kinder and gentler America that uh, it's kinder and gentler to uh, tax pack to taxpayers uh, uh, in order to uh, mm. make it easier on people who have not uh, lived up to their responsibilities. You see that right now carried to extremes in this administration where, you know, pe people who never took, never took out a $700,000 loan in their lives now have to subsidize people who did take out a $700,000 mortgage loan and couldn't afford it. So... It is the case that either you have a Ronald Reagan in place fighting for American principles, mm. and Ronald Reagans don't come along that often, mm -hmm. or even a Republican and temperamentally conservative president mm. such as George H.W. Bush mm. will come under such cultural and political pressures that the drift to the left, oh, the yes. that, will con that will continue. Yes, you know, well, what, what you generally have had in recent times is uh, people moving to the left rapidly under Democrats and slowly under Republicans. All right.